Thank you very much, Inha, for this very gentle and uh, exaggerated uh, introduction. It sounds very good. I don't know if it's all true, but it sounds very <laughs> good. And of course, it's a great pleasure to be here again after, I think, 10 years or so, when I was <laughs> invited here. Genoa and me, we know since 23 years. Oh, so it. yeah, I counted it. <laughs> Met him first in Japan, in Kyoto in a library and he was just a little boy you know running oh. around <laughs> so times have changed now he is one of the leading figures in the study of east asian buddhism in the world and it's of course a great pleasure where we could keep our friendship and that i have the opportunity to be here again so thanks to you for the invitation but thanks also to vicky baker who organized everything so perfectly and thanks to carol lee in the back communication officer who did also a great job. It's uh, wonderful to be here and also of course thanks to our sponsors, namely the Glorisan Global Network for Buddhist Studies and the Frog Bear Project if I understand correctly. I want to also transmit some greetings to you from my home university. For those of you who have not been here, some of you come from Hamburg or have been there. So that was Hamburg on a beautiful day. You know that Vancouver and Hamburg have many things in common. One is the weather, and it's hard to find a blue sky like this, so I used that opportunity to take a nice photo of our central university building, which this year celebrates 100 years of existence. It's not very old in Germany, but... You can see maybe three years older. Okay, good. And as you might have heard, this year uh, we had the great pleasure in Hamburg to become an excellence university which is comparable to the Ivy League in the US. So it's one of the 10 best universities in Germany now, whatever that means. You can see this is the central building. And on the right side, that's the so-called Asia Africa Institute, ASEAN Africa Institute. This is the inside. Genoa knows it well. Uh, this is where I come from. And this is one of the largest research institutes in Europe and in Germany on Asian studies. So many Asian languages, many Asian cultures, many Asian religious are studies are studied that. It's of course not as big as here in Vancouver. It's not, not comparable, but within Europe it's quite a, a big research institute with a focus on Asia. So that's where my home is and that's where you also find the Numata Center, which is a hub, as Genoa said, for Buddhist studies in general. So whoever passes by in Hamburg, you're all welcome to let me know and have a look at our institute. This year, uh, I also wanted to mention it's a web page of our Numata Center. You can see on the top right, Buddhismuskunde Uni Hamburg. It's quite uh, recommendable because we have a lot of online publications which are free access style. You can see here just the first nine volumes of our Hamburg Buddhist Studies series. And if you look here, you can hardly read it, but you will see volume nine edited by Andrews, a guy called Chen. Guess who he is? He's sitting here. And uh, Liu, Rules of Engagement. So all our publications, after one year, after they have uh, appeared in print, they come out uh, as online publications. And you're all welcome to have a look at these publications. There might be some interesting titles also for your particular interests. So make a use and have a look at there. So that was a little bit of, of advertisement for my own institution, but what we will do today, I understand we have about one hour, and of course I'm not sure how much you know already about Buddha nature, so I decided to go for a rather introductory talk so that everybody will be able to follow. For those of you who are already much advanced and know a lot about Buddha nature, then I apologize that much of you, of what you will hear today, might be a little bit boring for you. So what I had in mind today is to speak based on my research about the idea that all sentient beings have Buddha nature, which is an old Indian idea. And I wanted to look into some of the earliest sources of this idea and that can be counted as uh, one of the closest predecessors of these earliest ideas. As you know, ideas don't fall from heaven but they all have a prehistory. So today I want to look a little bit into this prehistory and then present you 
some of what can be called the oldest sources we have on the idea that all sentient beings have uh, Buddha nature. And I also decided that you should get a first-hand impression on the text itself. So I want you to read through the text. I apologize, it might be a little bit much of text, but I think it's always a good idea to read this text in original, of course not in Chinese or Tibetan or Sanskrit, but we will read that in translations into English, but so you can get a first-hand impression of how this idea for the first time came into existence, of how it manifested for the first time. And finally, we will deal with the concrete idea of Buddha nature based on what is maybe the most famous text on Buddha nature, namely the so-called Tathagata Garbha Sutra. I will tell you more about that so that you can get um, a first-hand impression of that. If you still have time left at the end, a little bit maybe, uh, I will also tell you a little bit about the recent developments in the research on Buddha nature by some other scholars. Uh, there has been a lot of things going on in the last two, three, four years. Speaking about that, uh, one of these very, uh, I think, great researchers on Buddha nature is a guy called Michael Radich from New Zealand, who is now based in Heidelberg in Germany, originally from New Zealand. Uh, he published this volume, I think, in 2015 in our Hamburg Buddhist Studies series called the Mahaparinirvana Mahasutra and the Emergence of Tathagata Gaba Doctrine. So that is an extremely important contribution to the study of the history of Buddha nature. And I will tell you later why. This is one volume which you can find freely accessible online on our webpage. And the second volume, I think, is published in the same year or one year after by Jonathan Silk, Buddhist Cosmic Unity. This is an edition and translation of another very important text of the early sources of Buddha nature, uh, translated from the Chinese. And finally, another book which has not come out yet and will not be published in Hamburg, but at University of Hawaii Press by a quite young uh, and excellent uh, British scholar from Oxford University named Christopher Jones. And uh, the topic of his book is The Buddhist Self on Tathagata Garbha, meaning Buddha nature, and Atman. This is a very, of course, hot topic, and I think we will have some kind of discussion on that also today, whether Buddha nature thought is also Atman, the teaching of a self, or not. So this is a book which we eagerly await, maybe going to be published this year or latest in the next year. So having said that, um, Many of you, of course, uh, will have an idea of the history of Buddhism, how it developed. And when I speak about the history of Buddhism, what I have in mind is the intellectual, the philosophical history of Buddhism. You have heard about Mahayana Buddhism, the strand of a great vehicle within Buddhism, which is a later development starting in around the beginning of the Kamen era and then developed in the first centuries of the Kamen era, starting in India, and then, of course, with many source texts which are not available anymore in the Indian languages like Sanskrit, but available in Tibetan or Chinese. Why is that the case? Because manuscripts in India did not have a long durability due to the climate. But gladly, many of these early texts dating from the second century, third century, had been translated into Chinese, first of all, starting in the second century AD, running on into the second millennium and of course there are many translations which have been performed starting from the 7th 8th century into Tibetan. So these are other sources which you have to take into consideration in case there is no Sanskrit, there is no Indian original which is often the case with Mahayana literature. What I want to say is that um, these ideas that all sentient beings have the nature of the Buddha, that they have Buddha nature is something which originated with uh, great uh, plausibility in India, even though most of the text we don't have in Indian sources, but we have to reconstruct, so to say, what was said in Indian from Chinese and Tibetan sources today. So what are the main characteristics of this idea that all sentient beings have Buddha nature? You can see two Sanskrit terms. I don't want to give you too many Sanskrit terms. I assume not many of you know Sanskrit. 
But two terms I have to mention, and the first one, which you've already heard, is Tathagata Garbha, and the second one is Buddha Dhatu. Tathagata is just another name for the Buddha, the awakened one, and Garbha has a variety of meanings. One meaning is embryo, one meaning is a womb, and another meaning is just a technical one, namely meaning containing, holding, hosting. So basically for this term, Tathagata Gaba, which became emblematic when you talk about Buddha nature, you have three ways to translate that. You can say all living beings have a Buddha embryo, which implies that there is some kind of embryonic element, but which still has to grow, an embryo grows. The second way to explain that is that all sentient beings have a womb of a Tathagata, a womb for a Tathagata, a womb of breeding a Tathagata, if you want. And the third meaning is, and that's the most massive one, the, most, the strongest formulation of that, all sentient beings contain, all sentient beings host a Buddha. This is, of course, slightly different, because if you say all sentient beings have a Buddha, then the Buddha is not an embryo anymore, but the Buddha is already manifested, full-fledged, if you want, inside. This is the uh, central term in Sanskrit, and it shows you already that the use of this term suggests that there are all kinds of different interpretations which might be willingly done in order to keep the spectrum of ideas quite open at this early time. At this early time. The second famous term for Buddha nature in Sanskrit is Buddha Dhatu. Dhatu also has a variety of meanings. One meaning is element, so you could translate all sentient beings have the element of a Buddha, whatever that concretely means. But Dhatu can also mean a mind, yeah, a Buddha mind, maybe a mind of Buddha qualities. But it can also be in another meaning, Datu could mean a relic. Yeah, the relics of the Buddha, of holy persons, are often called Datus. So Buddha Datu could also mean a Buddha relic. These two terms are the most common terms. They appear in most of the earliest texts of Buddha nature. And later on you will see how they are used in the texts. So what are the main characteristics very easily spoken of Buddha nature? First of all, I think it's fair to say that this idea uh, has in mind all sentient beings carry a kind of precious elements within themselves. However you want to see these precious elements, embryonic or already full-fledged, there's some precious elements. This is the first criteria. The second point is uh, the fact is that sentient beings don't know about that. Why? Because it is hidden. Like all of us, mm -hmm. according to this teaching, have that, but we don't know about that. This is another very characteristic feature of this early Buddha nature teaching. And the third point is, you need somebody to point that out. Classically, that is a Buddha or another religiously advanced person who comes and can tell you, look, there is a Buddha nature in you. Don't you know that? You should know that and you should work on that. And once sentient beings realize that, that's already the first stop, the first step on the career of becoming a Buddha. Realizing that there is and then starting somehow to work on that. So I think these are three um, essential characteristics which you will find in most ideas expressed by Buddha nature text in the earliest times. And once you start to work on that, of course, it will lead you to awakening, it will lead you to becoming a full Buddha if you want in the end. So basically there are two dimensions in uh, the Buddha nature teachings. There is a dimension of quality and a dimension of quantity. The dimension of quality is that you indeed can become a Buddha, maybe you are already a Buddha. This is a qualitative dimension. And the other one is of quantity Namely, all sentient beings, without any exception, have this Buddha nature. So these are two quite uh, important differentiations. One is in terms of including everybody, universally, as was the title of my talk. And the other one is the quality, namely that we all can or must or should become Buddhas. No other ideas. I'll tell you later why other religious ideas like Arhatship, if you have known that, I will talk about that, is not anymore in the focus of Buddha nature thought. This teaching, and I already mentioned that, has not been there from the beginning. 
Many Buddhist lay followers believe that the idea that sentient beings have Buddha nature is something which a Buddha has taught in the very beginning. That's not the case. If you look to the oldest sources we have on, in the history of Buddhism, primarily if you look to the Pali Canon, which has been completely preserve, preserved for us, you will not find the idea that all sentient beings have Buddha nature. There is no term Tathagatagaba, there is no term Buddha Datu. That's something which came along with the development of Mahayana Buddhism starting from the common era. So this we have to keep in mind. Yeah? As any religion, religion develops, it's nothing stati static. If a religion becomes static, then it's usually lost because it cannot adapt anymore to the needs of the time. And this is, of course, also true in the history of Buddhism. Later on, Tathagatagaba is found in most of the regions, if not all regions, where Mahayana Buddhism became popular, Tibet, Central Asia, East Asia. Uh, correct me if I'm not right, Genoa, but I think uh, Tathagatagaba, Buddha nature, has played an enormous role in the history of East Asian Buddhism, the history of Korean Buddhism, the history of Japanese Buddhism, albeit by another term, but it's present there. But, and that's quite surprising, you also can find similar ideas of Buddha nature in uh, Theravada countries like Thailand. That's quite interesting and it's a new development in research and I want to go into that here. But of course these ideas are not genetically related. You could argue that uh, probably any religion in the world has the idea that some precious element, be it a part of God or be it a part of Buddhahood, is already present within us. Basically, in re if you look at that in terms of religious studies, the question is how can we as simple, profound human beings connect to the transcendental? And one idea to bring that together is to say, well, a part of that is inside you. Now you have similar ideas in Gnostic movements of Christianity, for instance. So it's not that uncommon and it's just to be expected that also Buddhism has this kind of thought. And this is what Buddha nature teaching is about. And I also want to mention that in the 1990s there was a movement, that was the time then Genoa and I started in Kyoto, there was a movement which was quite critical towards, towards uh, Buddha nature thought because there were scholars who argued that this is not really Buddhism. This is a kind of Hindu thought which crept into Buddhism and destroyed the critical spirit of Buddhism. Critical spirit of Buddhism first of all means no self and secondly dependent origination. And you will see later that Buddha nature is maybe not in all respects on line with this kind of philosophical definition which was given by these critical scholars who call themselves Hihan Bukkyo in Japanese, so critical Buddhists. But nowadays I think uh, we have already gone one stage more and it's not a very active movement anymore. So let us start with um, some of what I think the earliest ideas which you, if you wanted, could connect to Buddha nature, found not in Mahayana Buddhism, but found in the early sources of Pali Buddhism. Yeah, Pali Buddhism is uh, a particular school of Buddhism which is today prominent in Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and uh, it's in so far a very interesting movement because it has preserved its canon almost completely. And I have uh, looked for a passage in the so-called Anguttara Nikaya, and this is all from the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi, that's the most common one used in the West, in the numerical discourses of the Buddha, and this is just a passage where um, the Buddha talks about the nature of the mind. And that's quite interesting, that's why I give you that in full length. And I will just read it so that you get an impression. Bhikkhus, that's a name for the ordained monks in the tradition of Buddhism. Suppose there were a pool of water that was cloudy, turbid and muddy. Then a man with good sight standing on the bank could not see shells, gravel and pebbles and shoals of fish swimming about and resting. For what reason? Because the water is cloudy, so too it is impossible for a monk with a cloudy mind to know his own good, the good of others, of the good of both, or to realize a superhuman distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of a noble one. For what reason? Because his mind 
is cloudy. And now we have the opposite. Monks, suppose there were a pool of water that was clear, serene and limpid. Then a man with good sight standing on the bank could see shells, gravels and pebbles and shoals of fish swimming about and resting. For what reason? Because the water is limpid. So too, it is possible for a monk with a limpid mind to know his own good, the good of others, and the good of both, and to realize, and so on. For what reason? Because his mind is limpid. So he points out two basic categories of the mind. One is the mind is cloudy, and once it is cloudy, it's like dusty water. You can't see what is inside. If your mind is pure and limpid, you can see uh, what's going on. You can penetrate your mind. You can see the qualities of other people. This is one characteristic how to describe the mind. The second one, monks, just as sandalwood is declared to be the best of trees with respect to malleability and wieldiness, so too I do not see even one other thing that, when developed and cultivated, is so malleable and wieldy as the mind. A developed and cultivated mind is malleable and wieldy. Many of you who maybe have connection to the circles of practicing Buddhism will know this citation because it's very famous. Uh, if you think what neuroscientists today tell you about uh, the effects of meditation on the mind, it's very much what it said here. You can even see that in brain research that if you do meditation, your mind, your brain, your physical brain uh, takes another form, takes another shape. So this is certainly true that the mind is something very flexible and you can m make it malleable as much as you want. So this seems to be a second characteristic in this old text. Third, bhikkhus, monks, I do not see even one other thing that changes so quickly as the mind. It is not easy to give a simile for how quickly the mind changes. Number three, it's not very clear what is meant with here. Probably the momentariness of, e of every mind moment. The mind is changing every moment. You all know that. Yeah, you have a good feeling, maybe uh, you get a bad news, you have a bad feeling, and so on. That can change very quickly. But now this is what I want to draw your attention to, namely the fourth characteristic in this row of descriptions of a mind, namely luminous monks is this mind, but it is defied by adventitious defilements. Luminous bhikkhus is this mind and it is freed from adventitious defilements. Luminous bhikkhus is this mind, but it is defied by adventitious defilements. The uninstructed worldling does not understand this as it really is, Therefore, I say that for the uninstructed worldling, there is no development of the mind, and the opposite, luminous monks, is this mind, and it is freed from adventitious defilements. The instructed noble disciple understands this as it really is. Therefore, I say that for the instructed noble disciple, there is development of the mind. This is quite interesting, and you will see there are pages and pages and pages of discussions what that actually means. Huh? The mind is illuminous and if it is defiled it's only adventitious. I'm not sure, English is not my mother tongue, whether adventitious is a good word if that says anything to you, but what is meant in Sanskrit is the term agantuka which has a meaning of being a guest. It's just a guest like I'm here at British Columbia coming in giving a lecture and going again. It's nothing which is essentially by a contract or by becoming a, a great professor like Jinhua at this university, being connected to this university, I come and go. And this is the structure of these defilements. Yeah? Defilements is a technical term in Buddhism for all kinds of emotional and intellectual bad things like hate, greed, stupidity, all these things you don't want. And these things are connected to the mind, but never essentially. This is what is said here. Why? Because the mind is by its nature illuminous. Very important. This characteristic, this fourth characteristic, appears in one of the oldest texts of Buddhism. And later on in the centuries to come, by the promoters of Buddha nature thought, have taken up again and again and again. It's often discussed in a sense that says, well, that has nothing to say, it's not what really is meant by the Buddha nature thought, but I think this is really something interesting. And you will see that the differentiation between something which is there, a mind, 
which maybe is more than just a momentary appearance. And on the other hand, defilements, which might be associated with this mind, with this illuminous mind, but never essentially, only outside. Like a gold nugget, we will see that later, which is a sense, in its essence, is gold, but you might have some dirt outside. But this is not essentially connected to the gold. Gold is gold, and you can wipe them away. They are just adventitious. They are just guess on this gold. This is a very important passage. That's why I wanted to show you that it appears there in the oldest canon, even though it has at this point nothing to do with Buddha nature. It's only later on that it was interpreted in that way. This is one important source, which was obviously quite inspiring for those who developed the idea of Buddha nature. Another source which is quite essential for Buddha nature thought is a text I guess you all have heard of, namely the so-called Sadharma Pundarika Sutra, or in English, the Lotus Sutra. Who has heard of the Lotus Sutra? <laughs> ah, most of you, you see. It's, many, many. it's maybe the most important text in the history of Buddhism, yeah, especially in, in East Asia, the translation by Kumara Jiva became so, so uh, important in the tradition of Buddhism. What does it stand for? Well, the Lotus Sutra portrays the Buddha as a father of all beings. It has a kind of paternalistic stand in the sense of the Buddha takes care of all living beings. He advises living beings. Another important topic in the Lotus Sutra is the Buddha as somebody who never dies. That became obviously an important question in uh, early Buddhist ideas, namely the Buddha dies and then what happens? The Lotus Sutra promotes the idea that the Buddha actually never dies. If it seems he dies, he just pretends it, but that is just in order to encourage people to practice on their own. But he doesn't die. He doesn't need to die. He could live on, but he pretends to die so that people get encouraged to practice by themselves. There's a famous uh, simile in the Lotus Sutra of, I think it's five sons of a doctor, and they're all playing around and having joy and having fun. Huh? Three cars, three cars, huh? three vehicles. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's also in there. And then uh, the father decides that he has to disappear, and he goes away, but he pretends he dies, and then suddenly the sons oh. understand that, oh, it's a really serious situation. Our father is not here anymore. Now we have to start our practice. <laughs> in the same way, they say that's what the Buddha did also, but he didn't die. So that's another important topic in uh, the Lotus Sutra. Another idea is that of upaya. Maybe you've heard about that. Maybe the question how to approach sentient beings, how to turn them into Buddhists. Maybe you don't have to tell them the full truth at the beginning because that might be too shocking, but you give them pieces of truth step by step, and in the end you can turn them into uh, your followers. So that's the idea of upaya, which the Lotus Sutra portrays um, quite extensively. And very important is the idea of ekayana. That means one vehicle theory. I think we have mentioned that before. The Lotus Sutra quite clearly uh, promotes the idea that there are no two vehicles, that there are no three vehicles, there's only one vehicle. And what does that mean? Only one vehicle means all sentient beings can only become a Buddha. There's no alternative. If there is an alternative like becoming an arhat, a kind of early Buddhist saint, which is still the ideal today in many Theravada countries, this is just an illusion. They say, well, you can believe, you can awake to that, but it's impossible because you have the potential to become a Buddha. How could you become something else? It's like a seed of mango. Could a seed of mango become an apple tree? No, because it's destined to become a Buddha. This is the idea the Lotus Sutra has, but still it is missing the special vocabulary which later is developed by Buddha nature thought. The Lotus Sutra just claims all sentient beings will become Buddha. You can see both dimensions. Dimension one is everybody without exclusion, all sentient beings. And secondly, quality, they all become Buddhas, nothing else. This is quite shocking actually for, for early Buddhists because their own ideal of becoming a saint, a Buddhist saint, an arhat becomes devaluated 
it becomes portrayed as a kind of stupid imagination. Now, you imagine you're an Arhat, well, you can believe it, but it's not true. The only real deliverance, the only real liberation is that of becoming a full Buddha. That's the idea of Mahayana Buddhism. But one question remains in the Lotus Sutra. It's not answered, namely, why would that be the case? And if you think of what Buddha nature thought then did, is it gave the answer to this question in a way. It gave the answer to the question why everybody would become a Buddha. Why? Because they have the Buddha nature. If you have a Buddha nature, you can't become something else. You can't become an Arhat. You cannot become a Pratyeka Buddha, which is another form of Buddha. You can only become a Buddha. So in that sense, as you can see already now, the Lotus Sutra has an enormous meaning for the development as a predecessor of Buddha nature thought. And I've again picked one passage for you from the Lotus Sutra, which I would like to read so that you see that the idea which hints into the direction of Buddha nature is already there, but the technical vocabulary has not yet developed. But the idea is almost there. And reading from a later standpoint, as Kumara Jiva did, he interpreted this idea of Buddha nature into the text, but in the Sanskrit it's not there. Yeah, Kumara Jiva takes a lot of freedom when he translates this text, but it's actually not in the Sanskrit. So excuse me for these a little bit long citations, but that's also, I think, interesting to get the original spirit of this text. So that's uh, eighth chapter, the similar for hidden gem, translated 1884, yeah, which this tells you a lot about Indology. We're still using translations from the 19th centuries because, as far as I know, the Lotus Sutra has not been translated into English from the Sanskrit uh, after 1884. Yeah, from Chinese, of course, we have many translations. On hearing from the Lord the announcement of their own future destiny, the 500 saints, uh, the arhats of the old ideal of deliverance, contented, satisfied, in high spirits and ecstasy, filled with cheerfulness, joy and delight, went up to the place where the Lord was sitting, the Buddha, reverentially saluted with their heads his feet and spoke thus, We confess our fault, O Lord, in having continually and constantly persuaded ourselves that we had arrived at final nirvana. As persons who are dull, inept, ignorant of the rules, for, O Lord, whereas we should have thoroughly penetrated the knowledge of the Tathagatas, the Tathagata wisdom, we were content with such a trivialing degree of knowledge. Yeah, here you see, finally, the Arhats who have thought they have attained final deliverance, they understand, no, that's not what we can do. We can become Buddhas. And they say, we have been content with the trivialing degree of knowledge. Yeah? but we should have gone for much more. And now, a simile, you will see that much of Mahayana literature consists in similes. And here we have another famous simile. It is, O oh Lord, as if some man, having come to a friend's house, got drunk or fell asleep, and that friend bound a priceless gem within his garment with the thought, let this gem be his. After a while, O oh Lord, <clears throat> that man rises from his seat and travels further. He goes to some other country where he is befallen by incessant difficulties and has great trouble to find food and clothing. By dint of great exertion, he's hardly able to obtain a bit of food with which, however, he's contented and satisfied. The old friend of that man, O Lord, who bound within the man's garment that priceless gem, happens to see him again and says, How is it, good friend, that you have such difficulty in seeking food and clothing, while I, in order that you should live in ease, good friend, have bound within your garment a priceless gem, quite sufficient to fulfill all your wishes. I've given you the, that gem, my good friend, the very gem I've bound within your garment. Still you are deliberating what has been bound, by whom, for what reason and purpose. It is something foolish, my good friend, to be contented than you have with so much difficulty to procure food and clothing. Go, my good friend, betake yourself with this gem to some great city, exchange your gem for money, and with that money do all that can be done with money. Yeah, quite interesting. I don't know if Genoa, when we met, put a gem somewhere in my, in my <laughs> cloth. I should check, probably. Take it, take it. <laughs> so, and now the other side of a simile, namely that what uh, in Buddhist history, in Buddhist thought, is going to be expressed. 
In the same manner, O Lord, has the Tathagata, the Buddha, formerly, when he still followed the course of a Bodhisattva, raised in us the ideas, or maybe better translation here is the wish of omniscience. But we, O Lord, did not perceive nor know it. Yeah? So the Buddha put in all of us the idea, the wish of omniscience, which stands here for awakening, but we do not know it, we do not perceive it. We fancied, O oh Lord, that on the stage of Arhat, this early ideal of uh, saintness, we had reached nirvana, deliverance. We live in difficulty, O oh Lord, because we content ourselves with such a trivialing degree of knowledge, but as our strong aspiration after the knowledge of the all-knowing has never ceased, the Buddha teaches us the right, namely, have no such idea of nirvana, monks. There are in your samtana, in your stream of mind in your mind stream, roots of goodness, which of your I fully developed. In this you have to see an able device of mine that from the expressions used by me in preaching the law, you fancy nirvana to take place at this moment. And after having taught us the right in such a way, the Lord now predicts our future destiny to supreme and perfect knowledge. Yeah, so the idea here is very much what we will see later in Buddha nature thought that all we have the wish to attain full awakening, it's put into us in some way by the Buddha, but we ignored it. But finally we realize that it is and we strive for awakening. We go beyond this tiny uh, sainthood principle of arhatship. This is what this uh, simile wants to say, even though you will see it does not mention the term Tathagata Garba or Buddha Dhatu, there is no mentioning of Buddha nature. Why? because obviously at this time the Lotus Sutra is a quite early text. Today we think that maybe it developed in the first or second century AD. The idea of Buddha nature has not been in existence, but the, the, the stream of thinking is there, as you could see. Yeah, he says, why, why do you do that if you can't go for more? Why are you you're happy here? Go for more. It's in you. I gave it to you. Just make use of that. Yeah, I think this is a very indicative simile and also in terms of the structure you will see there are close parallels to what we later find in Buddha nature thought. So, so far I could talk more about the Lotus Sutra but I think that's just enough to give you the impression to show you that the Lotus Sutra is really fundamental for the development of Tathagata Garbha. The next, and that's a very beautiful simile, many of you will know, I think Jinua will be excited because much of what we later know from Huayen ideas uh, is coming from uh, this text. So this is a quotation from the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Huayen Sutra, found uh, in the Ratnagocha Vibhaga, one of the classical texts of Buddha nature, but as you see the original is really from an early sutra text, namely the Avatamsaka. And just read that, it's, it's beautiful I think. O oh, son of a Buddha, suppose there would be a big painting cloth of the size equal to great three thousand thousands of worlds. And indeed, on this big cloth, the whole great three thousand thousands of worlds would be described completely. The great earth would be described in exact size of the great earth, the two thousand worlds in their own full size, in the same way the thousands of worlds, the four continents, and so on, the northern continent, the southern continent, and so on, all these worlds, the whole universe, basically, would be written or painted on this cloth in their own size. It's a huge cloth and the whole world is portrayed there. And thus this big cloth would have the same size as the expansion of the great three thousand thousands of worlds. Furthermore, this very big cloth would enter within one particle of an atom. Just as this big cloth lies within one small particle of an atom in the same way in each of all the other particles of atoms, too, there enters a big cloth of the same size. That's very beautiful. I sometimes remember here this USB stick. And on this small USB stick, basically my whole life is there. <laughs> all the photos I ever took, if it is 128 gigabyte, you can put all the photos you took in your life on there. All your CVs, all your books, your publications, your articles, it's all on this USB stick in there. Similar idea, the whole universe is painted, compressed together, and in each, uh, in each atom of which the world consists, the whole world is inside there. That's the birth hour of what later, you know, by Thich Nhat Hanh, whom you might know, is called the interdependence. Everything is inside any there and influences each other. 
It's later much developed in Huayan philosophy, but this is the, at least one kind of origin of that. Okay, so we have this situation. All the atoms have the whole universe painted in there, compressed. Suppose there should appear one person, very learned, clever, intelligent, wise and possessed of the skill to approach there to the big cloth. And his divine eyes were perfectly pure and clear. With these divine eyes he would perceive and say, why does this big cloth of such a great nature stay here in such a limited small particle of an atom? It is of no use for anybody. So he would think, now I will break this particle of an atom by the force of great efforts and let this great cloth become useful for the world. Then, producing the strength of great effort, he would break this small particle of an atom with a subtle diamond and would make that great cloth useful for the world as was his intention. Not only for one particle, but also for all the remaining atoms, he would act in the same way. So he is the person who knows. You remember the, second, uh, the third criteria I gave you before of Buddha nature thought was that you need a wise person who can help you develop that. So here he is. He knows that, he realizes that with a divine eyesight and he splits that open. Now, the other level of the simile. Similarly, O son of a Buddha, the wisdom of the Tathagata, which is the immeasurable wisdom, the profitable wisdom for all living beings, thoroughly penetrates within the mentality, the mind stream of every living being. Sometimes it's the same term which was used in the Lotus Sutra before. And every mental disposition, again mind stream, of a living being has the same size as the Buddha's wisdom. So we all, every sentient being has the same size as the Buddha's wisdom. Only the ignorant, however, being bound by misconception, does neither know nor cognize nor understand nor realize the wisdom of Tathagata within himself. Therefore, the Tathagata, having observed the state of all the living beings in all the universal regions by his unobstructed wisdom, resolves to be a teacher and says, Oh, what a pity. These living beings cannot cognize properly the wisdom of a Tathagata, so it penetrates them. It's inside themselves. Oh, I shall try to withdraw all the obstacles made by the wrong conceptions for the sake of these living beings through teaching the Eightfold Holy Path in order that they would by themselves, by accepting the power of the Holy Path, cast off a big knot of conceptions and would recognize the wisdom of the Tathagata within themselves, also that they could obtain equality with the Tathagata. In accordance with this declaration, they remove all the obstacles made by wrong conceptions through the teaching of the Holy Path of the Tathagata and then all the obstacles created by wrong conceptions are withdrawn then this immeasurable wisdom of the Tathagata becomes useful to the world. It's a little bit questionary what is meant with useful here. But in any case, it's something very um, positive, of course. So here you can see uh, the idea that the wisdom, the knowledge, the prajna of the Tathagata penetrates from the mind of the Tathagata through all the minds of sentient beings. This is quite impressive because, as you can see, it says living beings become on the same level with Buddhas. This also is clearly a pre-stage of what we later formulate in terms of every sentient being has a Buddha nature, only the perspective here changes, namely this perspective is that of an almighty, very much avatamsaka, very much huayen like Buddha, who penetrates his wisdom through all sentient beings, whereas in the Buddha nature thought, you will see that the perspective is not so much from the Buddha, but it's more from the individual sentient beings. The individual sentient beings who holds this kind of wisdom as a kind of small package already within themselves. So it's not anymore the connection to the Tathagata which is mentioned here, but it's more uh, the individual package each of us has. But the idea, of course, you will see is very, very close to what we have uh, in Buddha nature thought. So that was uh, what I wanted to uh, discuss in terms of the pre-stages of the predecessors. We have not so much time left, but still I want to show you some of, let's say, the ready uh, formulations of Buddha nature in its classic form in a sutra called the Tathagata Garbha Sutra, so the Buddha nature sutra, which is available in a couple of sources, namely 
in two Chinese translations by Buddha Bhadra and Amogavatra, and in two Tibetan translations. Unfortunately, we have no Sanskrit uh, text of that anymore. That is lost. We have some citations from that in a Sanskrit text, but the original is not here anymore. And if you're really interested in that, you, I re refer you to my own book, which was published a long time ago. And this is a, a very detailed analysis and translation of this text. So what I want to do now is I want to just give you some first-hand examples of how probably at a very early stage, maybe one of the earliest texts of Buddha nature, the idea that all sentient beings have Buddha nature is uh, portrayed. And you will immediately see how that connects to what we have seen before to the text, uh, which are the predecessors of the Tathagata Gaba Sutra. Um, the text starts with a beautiful scene, as many Mahayana Sutra starts. Uh, suddenly, big lotus flowers manifest in the sky, and the people are quite impressed and say, wow, what's going on? Big lotus flowers, huge, the whole sky is covered with that. But then suddenly, by the power of the Buddha, these lotus flowers start to wither, and they become ugly. And the Buddhas, which are sitting in the center of this lotus flowers, I guess you all have seen that there's a lotus flower with a kind of a stamp in the middle, and on this stamp there are Buddha statues sitting in meditation. They are illuminating, beautiful, and suddenly these lotus petals start to, to wither, they become dirty, they smell bad, and they close, and the Buddhas can't be seen anymore. And then the people who said, right, what's going on here? And uh, the main uh, interlocutor of this text, his name is Vajramati, he says, well, that's obviously the Buddha wants to tell you something. And what does he want to tell you? He wants to tell you that, and we will see here uh, in the first simile, what he wants to tell you here is that we all are like a lotus, and we have a wonderful Buddha sitting in our body, but um, it's not to be seen easily because outside is not so beautiful. It's full of defilements. It's full of uh, unpleasant things. We actually don't want defilements. If you think back to the characterization of the mind, which we have read before, is illuminous with, with adventitious defilements. That's exactly the uh, words which are used here. So this uh, Buddha is sitting there in the lotus flowers, but is covered by the petals. And these petals are like adventitious defilements. So you have to get rid of the petals, and then the Buddhas will be manifest it again. So here is the original. The verses at the end of the first simile, this text has nine similes. We can't go through all nine, but I will pick out some beautiful ones. So the first one says, it is as if there were a disgusting lotus whose unsightly sheath-like petals were not opened out yet, whose inside containing a tathagata were unpolluted by the petals, and a person with divine vision perceives this. Yeah, again, you have a classical element. You need a person with divine vision. Normal people could not see that within the lotus, this ugly lotus, there is a beautiful Buddha sitting. <coughs> so you need this person with special vision. If this person peeled away its petals in the center of the body of a victorious one, which is a Buddha, would appear, and no impurity would then arise any longer from this Buddha. He would appear as a Buddha in the whole world. In the same way, I also see bodies of Buddhas placed in the midst of all living beings, encased in myriads of defilements that are just like the disgusting sheath of a lotus. And because I also desire to remove the defilements of those sentient beings, I'm continually teaching the Dharma, the Buddhist law, to the wise thinking. May these sentient beings become awakened, and I purify their defilements so that they may become Buddhas. My Buddha vision is like that person's divine vision. With the vision of a Buddha, I see that in all these sentient beings, the body of a victorious one is established. And in order to purify them, I teach the Dharma. Please also remember that this kind of direct speech, it's very similar to what we have seen in the Avatamsaka Sutra, where uh, the person says, oh my god, what's the use of all that? Yeah? Let's make it fruitful for the world. And here he says, may these sentient beings become awakened. So you also have a structural similarity of this simile to what we have seen in the Huayen Sutra. This is quite uh, nice because for a long time it has been thought that this is the origin of the term Tathagata Garba. As I said, Garba can mean containing a Tathagata. 
Coincidentally, also, there is the term Padma Garba, Padma Pema is a lotus, and a lotus garba is the calyx of a lotus. So it's the interior room of a lotus. If you imagine the petals closed, inside is a garba. And for a long time, it has been thought that the term Tathagata Garba got coined by this simile to the lotus sutra, uh, to the lotus calyx, where the lotus calyx is called Patma Garba, the lotus calyx, and Tathagata Garba containing a lotus. This is something which has been not accepted anymore in recent years by this new research, for instance, by Michael Radich. But that might be not so interesting for you. But this is the question which scholars are really interested in. Where does this term come from? So this is maybe uh, the most prominent formulation of Buddha nature in the early, in the early times. This is a nice one, the fourth simile. I can't go through all because our time will be too short, but this is a nice one. The fourth simile says, sons of good family. Again, it is like the example of a round nugget of gold belonging to someone who had walked along a narrow path and whose nugget had fallen into a place of decaying substances and filth, a place full of putrid excrement. In that place of decaying substances and filth, full of putrid excrement, the gold nugget, having been overpowered by various impure substances, would have become invisible and would have remained there for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, or 1,000 years, but it would, though surrounded by impure substances, never be affected by them owing to its imperishable nature. Because of the covering of impure substances, however, it could not be of use to any sentient being. Yeah, this is very much what you have seen um, in the simile of a mind, that the mind is illuminous, like gold is gold, and if there are defilements, they are just adventitious. They are just outside. You can get rid of them. Sons of good family, if then a divinity with divine vision looked at that round gold nugget, the divinity would direct a person, hey man, go and clean that gold of excellent value there, which is only externally covered with all sorts of decaying substances and filth, and use the gold in the way gold is to be used. Yeah, do you remember the simile of the Lotus Sutra? That the friend said to him, make use of this gem and use the gem as it should be used. Almost verbally quite, quite similar. Sons of good family, in the same way also the Buddha teaches the Dharma to send him beings in order to remove the defilements, which are like all sorts of decaying substances and mud, from the imperishable true nature of a Buddha found in all sentient beings. Very impressive, huh? imperishable true nature. So the defilements, which bother us sometimes, greed, hate, and so on, this is not our true nature. Our true nature is that of a Buddha. It's a pure nature. It's an undefiled nature. What we have to do is, of course, to purify that from these emotional, intellectual defilements on the way of becoming a Buddha. Very nicely expressed with a gold nugget. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a specialist in chemistry. <coughs> Maybe among you there are, there are specialists in chemistry, but I guess that gold is probably a very solid material and uh, it will not easily interact with other substances. I don't know how it how it behaves in excrements for a thousand years. But I guess that if it interacts, it might just be the surface. But of course, the essence of gold will be the essence of gold. Here's another example. We don't have to go in detail, but I can tell you the story. There is a poor man or somebody who thinks he is poor. And under his house, he's walking up and down in the house and thinking, how can I get money? But below his house, there's a big treasure. But he doesn't know about that. And of course, the simile goes that this treasure is like the Buddha nature. We all have it. We don't know. And we think we are not perfect. We think we are incomplete. We think we can't do anything. But indeed, this treasure is right within us, just as the treasure here is right under the house and he just has to dig it out. He doesn't do it because the treasure doesn't tell him and he needs somebody to tell him that, look, there's a treasure, start to dig. So again, you have the third element of somebody with a special insight, in this case the Buddha, to encourage him to dig it out. Yeah, that's an interesting one because that's one of the nine similes which has the connotation of something growing and developing. 
if you have uh, seen the other examples until now, the other similes, it is clear that there is nothing to develop. A gold market is a gold market. It's already ready. There is no embryonic feature. There's nothing to grow. Gold is gold. It's, it's done already. Or the Buddha and the lotus flowers. It's already a full-fledged Buddha. It's done. But this example points into a slightly different direction. Namely, again, it is like the example of a fruit of a mango tree, a rose apple tree, a palmyra palm, or of cane. Inside the sheath of the outer peel, there is a seed of imperishable nature containing a sprout, a seed which, thrown on soil, will become a great king of trees. So here you see there is a developmental process. It's a seed, and you must put the seed on the ground, put water on that, it needs the sun, and if all that comes together, it will grow. So that seems to point into a kind of different connotation. It's not a full-fledged Buddha, but it's a kind of embryonic seed which still has, has to develop. In the same way, also, the Buddha perceives that sentient beings who are dwelling in the world are completely wrapped in the sheath of the outer peel of such defilements as desire, anger, misguidedness, longing, and ignorance. Sons of good family, in this connection, the Tathagata perceives that all sentient beings are like the seed containing a sprout and then propounds the matter to the bodhisattvas, which are particularly advanced sentient beings, in order that they might realize the Tathagata knowledge within. Okay. So here you have this example, there are only two of the nine which hint into a developmental process. And in that sense, the term garba, which as I said, can mean simply contain a Buddha, but it can also mean a Buddha embryo, is justified in this interpretation because this really implies there has to develop something. Yeah, this is another interesting example of a poor man. He, I don't know why he's poor, because he carries a Buddha image, an object of veneration, and he has to cross a dangerous desert, and he is, uh, he is afraid that the robbers might take this Buddha image from him, so he wraps it in very ugly cloth, so that, you know, if robbers come, he'll say, look, there's nothing, it's just dirty cloth. But then, by an accident, he dies, and this bundle containing the Buddha image is thrown on the ground, and of course, other people who pass by caravans, they would just say, ah, oh, what is this kind of dirty thing? And they put it away. But that's, of course, the Buddha image. So again, it's an example, I think, the simile which strikes out that um, all sentient beings have a Buddha nature, even if you might not expect it, even the most evil guy, and that, I think, is quite important for later developments in pure land Buddhism, even if he's an evil guy, and you would never expect that he can do something good. He has a Buddha nature. You just have to look at that. You just have to put it out. Nice example, actually. And this is a particularly nice one here. Yeah, that's the one I just mentioned, I think. This is an interesting one. It's about uh, a woman. And I think we should, we should read through that because it also has a kind of uh, ethical dimension. Again, it is like the example of a woman without a protector of unsightly complexion, having a bad smell, disgusting, frightening, ugly, and like a demoness. And this woman had taken up residence in a poor house. While staying there, she had become pregnant. And so the life that had entered into her womb was such as to be destined to reign as a world emperor, Chakravartin, so the highest worldly ruler in the world, the woman would neither question herself with reference to the sentient being existing in her womb, of what kind is this life, nor would she even question herself, has some life entered my womb or not? So she's not aware of that. Rather, thinking herself poor, she would be depressed and would think thoughts like, I'm inferior and weak, and would pass the time staying in the poor house as somebody of unsightly complexion and bad smell. Sons of good family, in the same way also all sentient beings think of themselves as unprotected and are tormented by the suffering of samsara, the cycle of, of death and being reborn again. They too stay in a poor house, namely the places of rebirth in the states of being. Then, so the element of a Tathagata, here the term is Buddha Dhatu, has entered into sentient beings and is present within, those sentient beings do not realize it. Sons of good family, in order that sentient beings do not despise themselves, the Tathagata in this connection teaches the Dharma with the following words, Sons of good family, apply energy without giving in to despondency 
It will happen that one day the Tathagata who has entered and is present within you will become manifest. Then you will be designated Bodhisattva rather than ordinary sentient being and then on the next stage you will become a full Buddha. Yeah, this is quite interesting because it seems to me to be a direct uh, appeal to sentient beings to go and to start to practice and to take this Buddha element within themselves serious. This also might give you a hint, yeah, maybe you should not overemphasize that, but I think it can give you a hint where these early um, authors actually come from and what they want to do. I think they intend this kind of teaching as a kind of direct encouragement for sentient beings to say, no, look, stop, you have Buddha nature, everybody of you can reach it, just find it, go for it, practice that. This is quite direct here, this uh, sentence in the end of the eighth uh, example. And the last example, the ninth one, is that of uh, figures of gold which are produced in a mold. Yeah, I think most of you probably know how you make gold figures in Nepal. Still today you can find that. You first of all take wax, bee wax, and you form the figure you want to do, animal or whatever. <coughs> then you put um, mud around that, you boil, you, you fire that, and then the wax will drop out. And then you turn it round, you put the gold inside, the gold takes the shape of the wax, and once the gold starts to cool down, you take a hammer and you can cut off the mold, and then suddenly, even though the mold is very dirty and ugly, the beautiful golden figure will come out. Here it's interesting because if you look into um, the technology of, of uh, producing these statues, it's very important to know the right moment when you have to use the hammer to take off the mold. It should not be too early because then the gold might still be liquid and it should not be too late because if it's too late, the gold might be cracked. So you have to know the right moment, which is quite indicative. Even the term upaya is used again because, of course, the Buddha will know exactly when it is the right moment to make this Buddha nature free of you. If it's not the right moment, it's useless. So you have to wait and to know exactly when you should act. So anyway, this is the ninth example. and. Uh, I think we should not go very farther. What I wanted to show you with these varieties of examples of similes is that each of these similes stresses different aspects. There is no absolute um, homogeneity among these similes. It's just like, you know, you want to portray something and you throw a lot of darts, call it darts, and then somehow you can see, aha, this is more or less what he's speaking about. But it's not yet a, a clear-cut um, deep philosophy. It's more a kind of upcoming thought and you say it's like this or this or this and this and then the picture which emerges is basically that what I have tried to define with these three basic criteria but the emphasis in this stimulus is actually quite different. Like in the last one you have seen it's actually the right moment you have to hit. The right moment you should teach the Dharma. Not too early, not too late. You have to know when or in the case of the, of the poor woman, it's the encouragement to her which is important to say, no, no, don't give up, you can do it. Each has a different um, uh, intention. And this, I think, is very typical for early Tathagatagawa, for early Buddha nature teaching. It's not a, a very homogeneous idea or intellectual pull out, but it's something which has its richness in all the different approaches and then over the centuries develops into a kind of more systematic philosophy, first of all in India by the Ratna Goja Vibhaga, but later of course in China and in Tibet, where hundreds of philosophers, uh, Tibetan philosophers, started to deal with these ideas and tried to put it into a kind of uh, logic uh, system of, of complex Buddhology. But this at this stage is not, not the case. So finally, uh, my last word is, as I promised you, I would uh, tell you a little bit about recent developments and I will be very short. Uh, the sad thing is, the sad point is that uh, the Tagadagawa Sutra is probably not the oldest sutra of this text. This is something which has come to the foreground in the last uh, five years, uh, especially by research by Michael Radich, but also by Stephen Hodge, a British-based scholar. 
and they argue that the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, another very important text in the history of Buddhism, is probably the oldest text, and um, the Tagatagaba Sutra probably comes later. So there's a kind of difference in the chronological arrangement of this text, and Michael Redditch's argument is that uh, the Buddha nature thought, at least one strand of Buddha nature thought, developed from a kind of docetic background, namely that um, it is impossible to assume that a Buddha would be born in a kind of dirty flesh and blood uh, womb, but the Buddha possibly can only develop in a kind of um, sociologically clean womb, which is the Tathagatagaba, the Tathagata womb. So I would think, yes, that's certainly true. On the other hand, uh, my impression is that the Tathagatagaba Sutra with the nine similes which you have seen here, which we have read here, is probably another strand of this Buddha nature thought. So I tend to think that there have been different points of origin which later on in the development of Mahayana Buddhism have been pulled together and tried to systematize. But at this point I think, yes, Reddish is probably right that the Mahaparinirvana Sutra is older, but the Tathagatagaba Sutra is probably another strand which was not strongly or maybe not influenced by the Mahaparinirvana Sutra developed independently. In so far, it is certainly a, a kind of original thought of Buddha nature thought, and only later developments, these two were put together. But this might be a discussion more for specialists. Um, what I hope today um, I did is that I gave you an impression of what the early history of Buddha nature looked like, and what their, the first texts were which inspired this authors of early Buddha nature. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.